given by Professor Stefan Bouchon, and he asked me explicitly uh, not to introduce him, and he will introduce himself. Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me, and in case my voice goes down too much, and don't hesitate to ask me or ask the body. <laughs> so, I'm the Patricia, as well as you say, we're in Germany and University of Paris too. So, I was initially educated in five years, not long ago. Forgot almost everything, and I'm now currently working in between computer science and uh, probability and statistics, and I will present you some tools that might be useful, or are currently believed to be useful in learning theory, and that should be uh, So I will try to organize the talk in the following way. So this first session will be dedicated to motivation, to tracing the roots of concentration of measure analysis to traditional probability, trying to get a flavor of uh, the kind of thing that you can tackle with concentration inequality, and give the first result that is interesting and for two reasons. First, because it's from a methodological viewpoint, and second, because it has already something to say to us, which is, which is the Eckenstein inequality. Yeah. And tomorrow, hopefully, I will talk about a set of recipes that can be used to derive concentration inequalities that are known as the entropy method. And then in third lecture, or maybe in the third and the fourth, I will talk about learning theoretical applications. And if time doesn't go too fast, I will talk about some more recent work that could allow us to deal with more general settings, for example, unbounded regression. And that can recent work, joint work with uh, Olivier Bousquet, Gabor Lukoski, and that kind of stuff. So this will be all in all, a very self-centered and personal presentation of this subject, mostly summarizing work with uh, Gabor, Pascal, and, and Pauline. So today, we start from good old stuff to more recent stuff. <coughs> The basic object is sum of independent random variables. And the very basic object is sum of bounded, centered, independent random variables. Okay. So the function of interest for all the set of vectors we will, call, will be called Z. So on each slide, the this we are looking for is Z. So Z is this one. What did we learn at high school or maybe later? <laughs> but that if you take quite many and n goes to infinity, well, the first thing that strikes our eyes is the law of large numbers that tells us that when n goes far away from any epsilon, then Z can be close to its expectation, which here is zero. And actually, the probability that it is larger than n times epsilon, this goes to zero for each epsilon. So this is what is usually called the first order result. This is the first kind you, you're looking at. And we already saw in Bernard's talk yesterday that uh, if your class of hypothesis uh, is reasonably small, that is, it contains just one possible function, such a uh, law of large numbers does a quite good work. It tells you that you can evaluate on a random sample the performance of a predictor, of a classifier. 
Well, you can even say a little bit more about the rate of conversion in this group of large numbers, and this is the celebrated central limit theory, which tells us that if we divide C, or the difference between C and its expectation, by square root of n, then the probability that it is smaller than a fixed case extends to this beautiful integral, which is known as the distribution function of the Gaussian distribution with the variant C. Here in this setting, I assume that not only here we have inequality, but equality. So this is very nice. This is that there are two main drawbacks in this nice view that these are asymptotic standards. Asymptotics is something like eternity. It's far away. <laughs> And in machine learning, this is real business. You need to be able to say something for fix that. So, because actually, it's not that easy to to have an idea about the, the speed of convergence in the central limit theorem, the kind of third order results, where there are some classical, beautiful results going back to We'll see in the next slide that tell us that what we see on those two plots, which this is a zoom on this one. Here the black curve is the distribution function of the Gaussian. And the this white constant curve, the blue and the red and the green are the distribution function of something that should tend to particularly the word <laughs> a Gaussian, which is a Properly normalized binomial uh, distribution. So the sum of Bernoulli plus minus one random variables with uh, success probability <coughs> zero dot three. So it goes fast, but not so easy to say how fast. Actually, we have this quite old research that tells us that provided it's high, the settlements are sufficiently integrable, you can give it an upper bound in this convergence. But still, it's not exactly what we need. Because in machine learning, we often need to look at events that, that are what we call rare events. So not typical deviations. That is not deviations of the order of square root of n. But deviations of the order of n, what are currently called large deviations in line the world probability theory. So this is what I mean. Very essence is nothing about it. And as a matter of fact, this is a totally different subject, a totally different area of probability theory. You know, the central limit theorem is sometimes called an invariance principle. That is, you take Anything that is square integrable, that has a second norm. You center, you sum, you normalize, and what you get out of it is a Gaussian. But maybe you're forgetting the distribution you started from. On the other hand, if you look at what goes on, on the top table, deviations of order n, deviations that are of the order of the variance of the sum, then you don't forget what's going on, what you, what you put at the beginning. So this is the subject of large deviation here. So our problem now is to find something that deals with non-asymptotic setting and that can reconcile the behavior of large deviations and small, moderate deviations. Well, let's look at what's going on if you want to investigate on a qualitative basis the tail probability of a Gaussian. So X is science. Assume X is a Gaussian with variance P that is centered and you want to estimate this. Putting those two dummy variables and performing integration by part, you will end up with this quantity. So the probability that X is larger than T 
will decline approximately as exponential minus t squared t times the variance, divided by t times the variance. There is an ancillary term here, we forget. But this will give us the, say, the goal, the framework, the graph of our quest. So, we have this as an ultimate goal that we may or may not be able to achieve. And we are concerned with that. So there is a nice set of tools that were not already uh, partly presented yesterday, which are called, known as a set of exponential inequalities. So for example, if z is a sum of n independent centered random variables, if you're using, you are a, a fan of something, you may use this inequality that will tell you that the probability that z exceeds its expectation by more than t is ever bounded by something that looks very, very Gaussian. Because assume that the summons are perfectly balanced, there are no random variables. So probability of getting a one is one half, and probability of getting minus one is also one half. Then this n is exactly the variance. So we're in a good shape. But if this is not the case, this may not be the best tool to use. There is a very nice inequality that goes back to the 20s of the preceding century due to the Russian mathematician Sergei Bernstein, which tells us that in the same situation, you can upper bound this probability by exponential minus t squared. So this looks very gauche. But in the denominator, you got two terms. And that tells us a lot. The variance of z. So if there was only that, we would be in a Gaussian set. And this term, which is t divided by, by 3. And so it means that if t is very small compared to the variance of z. So for example, think of t of the order of square root of n, while the variance of t is of the order of n. We can forget about that. We are in a moderate deviation regime, and things are Gaussian. If t of the contrary is of the order of x, we are in the large deviation regime, then we get a tail bound that has a poor Say, for example, probability that c is larger than p of c plus, uh, say, s times the variance of v, it's upper bounded by um, s squared variance of c two times one plus s over three. So this is, uh, and then, so if s is a constant, this is much more like an exponential scale than the Gaussian. But anyway, what's important is that this Bernstein inequality and doesn't show up. And so in a certain sense, it's a bit dimension three. What shows up is the variance of v, which may or may not scale with that. So, you know, for the moment, I have not told anything about concentration in quality. So, in order to get a flavor of what it is, I will make a few quotations from the grandmaster of concentration of measures here, <coughs> who is uh, Michel Calagrand. So, in his two, I mean, last big, big papers dedicated to this topic in 96, he made those two statements that really summarize the stop. You say, well, well, I let you read it. I relax a little bit. <laughs> so, so he has a grand ambition, and we may have some question in it. So, what if they depend not too much on each of the variables? So, 
how general is considered the more general function. And so learning theory and its empirical process theory has been a source of uh, many more general functions. <laughs> and but in computer science, in theoretical computer science, those sets of tools have become quite famous. Because concentration inequalities have something to say in the relations between combinatorial optimization and random combinatorials. I will try to give you a, an example of a much more general function on the toy combinatorial problem. So which I call which is called the random interval pattern. So here our independent random variables are no more numbers, they are intervals. So it's i, this is an interval from the sigma 0, 1, which is fixed by just picking two extremities uniformly at random. So you pick n of them, and then you ask, I want to find a subset among those n uh, random intervals where such that any two of them in the subset are disjoint. This is what I call a packing, and I want a packing which is as big as possible. So here z, the random variable of interest, is the maximum cardinality of the packing. Let's see a little bit what's going on. So actually this is not a hard combinatorial problem. We will first sort those 20 random intervals according to the location of the rightmost extremity. So this looks much better now. Because in order to select a, a, a maximum packing, we will just now use a greedy algorithm. So we sort it and then we will pick the first interval. Eliminate all the intervals that intersected. And then take the second, uh, the next one, and so on. And this greedy technique can be proved to be efficient to give you an optimal solution. And it's, I mean, the cost of it is just the cost of sorting n log n operation. So here is the maximum packing, so we don't get that much. The, the number of guys that get yeah, it's not the total measure of the interval. That could be another thing. I mean, it's, this point problem is sufficient for our purpose. So this is the algorithm. You can program it in MATLAB and make simulations over 100,000 random intervals to work. So we may ask questions about that. How does expectation of d behave as n goes to infinity? Do we have low large numbers, central limit theorems, asymptotic theorems? And what is the tail behavior for a fixed n? I mean, as far as I know, there is no obvious way of representing that, of coding this problem as a sum of IID random variables. So no obvious way to go back to the old set. And so in that sense, z is a kind of much more general function. Because it's a functional of many independent random variables, and it doesn't depend too much on each of them. Actually, if we modify one of those intervals, we want to modify the value of z by more than one. So in a sense, it's quite a smooth function of the random outcome. So to see how the expectation of z scales, we need to have this representation of the data. So one interval will be one point in the unit square. It's becoming the first coordinates while the second coordinate. Left extremity, right. And there, if you look at what the greedy algorithm does, well, here in the setting, we have 10,000 random intervals, and it has selected the blue ones. So it picks people along the main diagonal. And that's the distribution of points that is of interval is uniform. It means that we 
should get roughly something of the order of square root of n. Actually, exact computation tells you that the limiting value of c scales like square root of n, and scaling factor is 2 divided by square root of r. If you look worth a little bit more, you will realize that c actually satisfies the central limit theorem. That the scaling here is no more square root of n, it's n to the one fourth. So what about concentration inequalities? Concentration inequalities will strike back. Well, the, the key remark to apply a concentration inequality, the old one just got ago, is to notice that if C, the more general function, is larger than T, it means that we have a witness that there is a sequence of T intervals that are actually neutrally disjoint and that witnesses that we can find the packing of at least t intervals. And so it means we can say that a set of intervals for the packing, this is a kind of hereditary property of sets of intervals. And if you take a packing and take a subset of this packing, you still get a packing. So Z, our function of interest, is the largest cardinality of a subset that satisfies a hereditary property. And this is what Paragon has called the configuration function. And then you have off-the-shelf concentration inequality that tell you that, for example, the probability that C exceeds its expectation by more than T hmm, satisfies something which is really a Bernstein inequality. Okay, and so we'll see that, okay, I can tell you this is quite tight, as a matter of fact. And this gives you a flavor of what concentration inequality do. I mean, they tackle functions that are not some sort of random variable. They give us non-asymptotic statements. This holds for any end. And you get them not by focusing on the expected value of t. This can be still investigated in a separate uh, line of research, but just by focusing on the way z varies when you modify <laughs> some of the x parts. So on by focusing on the structure of increments. Okay? So this is a take-home message. If you want to sleep now, you <laughs> we'll get the end of the story, but you still might be able to figure out what to do. Much more general functions. Much more general functions. Yes. Is there a refactory Well, take a problem that has attracted a lot of attention in, in random combinatorics and like during the last decade, uh, this Poulin's problem. So you take a random permutation of one, the numbers, the integers from one to n. And you ask, what is the largest size of an increasing sequence, subsequence, in this random permutation? How does it scale? And actually, it scales like square root of n, two times square root of n on average. And, uh, well, this so. Being increasing is also an hereditary property. Subsequence is increasing, and set subsequence is increasing. So the same line of designing applies, and you can let's say something non-trivial, but in that case not optimal about the deviations. And if you want, there is a, a nice book by uh, Michael Steele that in the Cyan series about probabilities probability theory and combinatorial optimization that tackles many of those problems that you, I mean, you can read that in, in, in the tube or in the bus and it's a source of recreation. <laughs> so, and uh, now I will, how many times goes? <laughs> I will go 
go back to the old exponential inequality. It's the other way you derive, uh, normally derive uh, Bernstein inequality. And uh, talk a little bit uh, either about the Eisenstein inequality or Martinel approach to concentration inequality. I will ask you. So, Bernstein inequality. Once in a life, you should see it and try to derive it. Because many of the ingredients that are currently used in statistical learning theory are already in, in derivation and inequality. So, the first Ingredient is Markov inequality. So take Z as a random variable of interest and take F as a positive function which is non decreasing on T to the infinity. So the probability that T is larger than T is certainly equal to this. You can rewrite this in terms of expectation. And when this is 1, this is larger than 1. When this is zero, the value of this doesn't matter. So we have this inequality. And well, we can forget about this one, but we end up with this. So we have a relation between the Taylor probability of Z and some moments of Z. We can play with Markov inequality using different function effects. You can take fx is x squared, then you end up with the good old chip and chip. But in France, we say bien aimé chip and chip inequality. It's a well loved uh, chip and chip inequality. <laughs> Which is, I mean, that's what you choose at the beginning of the Latin Java inequality. If you want to play on a Chapman's League, you take an exponential function. That's, that's what we will use for that time. So, and then to end up with this. So, I wrote it in that way. Maybe it's not in the same way as in, in the printout. And so here we should have a plus. And this is a very important animal called the log of the score of Z. And you can play in between. So take Q, something between 2 and infinity. And you play Markov inequality. In any way, this is always the same story. So let's go on with this. So Z is a nice guy. We can rewrite this. This is the exponential mark of inequality. And then we can use the fact that the inside are independent. Good. But then we may con concentrate on that guy, use the well known power extension of the exponential, use the fact that this is assumed to be centered, so you can kill what happens for k equal 1, you can put absolute values, and then say, well, if the x signs are bounded, you can have a bound this by its i squared, and then taking the expectation, you get b. And then, you may take a product, sum, and you get that. And we already made the half problem. So, this function will show up many times, so it's good to name it. I hope I will be consistent in notation. I call it tau star. Then, so we ended it with that, and then you will try to opt we will try to optimize with respect to lambda. We take we have taken any lambda which is positive, find the best one, and there we we for the first time something which plays a very important role in concentration derivation of concentration inequality, which is Complex. I mean, I can say that dark radiation theory is a marriage in heaven between probability theory and convex analysis. This is not as true for concentration inequality, but far. So, 
the optimum is lambda, it's called the potential Legend transform of tau square, and this is well known, based in certain circles. <laughs> <laughs> so, the end of the story, and we will call this function tau. So, in the end of the story is the Bennett inequality, so tau according to this definition, and uh, if we work a little bit, this is truly an uh, analysis, we end up with Bernstein. This is a weakening of Bennett, which is what we wanted so far. It's uh, an exercise, we try without keeping a normal bound on this side. So now I can time goes on. So I may either spend some time on the Martinel approach, which has been historically and is still very important in classification in politics, or to go directly to Eckenstein inequality, which will prepare us for tomorrow. So I may, I may ask a question. Who in the audience has been exposed to Martingales? Could you raise your hand? That's not a good center. So, uh, I will go directly to Eppenstein inequality. And if some people want to ask a uh, private conversation about nothing else, approach, I would be happy to talk about it. So, now we go to Eppenstein inequality, which will be just a full result. We expect Brad Eppert, the inventor of it, with Brad and Stein, who is responsible for many results in statistics and probability, goes to the beginning of the, eight, of the 80s. And this is a very easy and quite efficient way of accounting to the variance of a general function of many independent random variables. So, I will first introduce some convention that I will use for the lectures. So, my set of S is this sequence of independent random variables. The guy I'm looking at is C, a function of those independent random variables. And I will often use uh, independent copy of the x files. Those ones may not be identical in distributed. The essential thing is independent. So x by r1 would be an independent copy of x1, and so on. So it's x by o. And we will very often consider two kinds of perturbation, perturbation, slight modification of c. In c, exponent i, you replace x i by its independent copy here. And in z subscript i, you consider another function, hopefully related to f, but that depends only on the other variable. It is uh, measurable with respect to all variables except x i. And both of them are And we will do consider two ways of quantifying the sensitivity of F to variations of its inputs. And those two quantities will be called B plus. So here you pay attention. Here we take expectation on the distribution of the independent copies. <coughs> so we assume that x1 is to its n. This is a short n for the sequence. I've been sampled. And we'll look at what happens to the c if we take our independent copies, substitute the copies into the, the, among the arguments of f, Look at the variations, square them, and just look at what happens on the positive part. 
and we sum it of our own possible image. And B is defined in a somewhat comparable way. So, but instead of taking the random copies, you just remove the people one by one and look in, in which way it affects the value of Z in that. So what is the Einstein inequality? It's a way of relating the variance of Z with the expectation of those two point groups. Matter of fact, ah uh, yeah, I will also use this not too conventional notation. So this is the variance of Z condition on a subset of the x i. So this is defined in the following way. We sample the x i's for i belonging to big i. You condition among their values. And you look at the variance of z conditionally of those values. So Einstein inequality, which is this, actually <coughs> says that if you can say something easily on D plus, this will or on B, this will be an upper bound on Z. Well, this inequality is quite nice. Actually, if you're thinking about some sort of independent random variables, it's tight. It's an equality. <coughs> So that's already there. And the two other remarks are philosophy, and the last remark is a pessimistic caveat. So it works usually quite well, but if you take some special function, for example, if Z is the product of the Xi, and the Xi turned out to be Bernoulli random value, the result is not that easy. And you have to pay a certain curves of not of dimensionality of degree. That's right. So now we will spend some time on proving the Einstein inequality and see how it works on the random packing problem. So we will prove this since this is a rather trivial. So in order to prove it, we will first give a first very cheap proof. We will So we will write Z as even though it's a general function, as a sum of people. They are mutually orthogonal. This is the celebrated 
orthogonality property of marking their inference and for i different from j. So we may take advantage of Ah. Ah. So this is this telescope, telescope in sun. So I made a square expansion and I come up with the, some outside the benefit. So this is the orthogonal. I may write more properly the expectations here. So expectation with respect to what? And then I will use something else to put out the expectation outside the red parenthesis, which is called the Jensen inequality. Another very useful tool, another alliance between probability and convexity. So if f is a continuous convex function, and if this has a meaning, so it's integrable, then the expectation of f is larger than f applied to the expectation of this. So if the distributions at the finite support, this is nothing but the very definition of convexity. And what's remarkable is that this Jensen inequality extends to much more general set. And I think it, it, it works for uh, in Hilbert spaces, in Banner spaces, in, in many, many topological vector spaces. So, I take my expectations here outside of the parenthesis. And what I get in the big bracket is actually exactly what shows up in the definition of B plus. So the proof of the differential inequality is two things. This decomposition in marking up increments. So we try to go as close as possible to a sum of independent random variables. And even if you don't know what marking elements are, just think that they are the next best thing after sums of independent random variables. <laughs> well, actually, we have orthogonal increments. Just as independent uh, centered random variables would have. So we go with that. And then, Jensen. This is your rabbit out of the hat. And you end up with it. So I will bore you for five more minutes. But I mean, it's somewhat too cheap. I mean, with those ideas, we wouldn't get far when trying to design the, I mean, prove the, what's called the cancelization property of, of N. Because actually we use convexity, but we I mean in some convexity you may hide another convexity. And actually here I use the convexity of x squared. But I mean a random variable x, which is square integrable, is actually a distinguished member of a vector space space of square integrable and variables. So we may define convex functions, convex forms on this uh, distinguished inverse space. And we have to, even the variance a convex function, and actually it is. And in a hidden way, we have used this convexity rather uh, actually, I, I, deal, I dealt with condition of Jensen inequality, which is much less elementary than it looks. So it's time to, to, to have a look at this. Actually, so 
in precious spaces, say, in finite dimensional spaces, you can still talk about Jensen inequality. So assume that X is the topology for vector space uh, on which you think about uh, space of continuous linear form for the dual, topology for dual. And there is a powerful result due to Rockefeller, which is called the dual equivalent. So beware that in those spaces, you may have convex functions which are really here behaved, which might not be continuous. So the real intuitions may be wrong. So if F, say, forget about numbers, lower semi continuity, think about continuity. The continuous convex function from X on the real, if she, J is defined on X star of the dual as actually the potential Legion transform of F, then F is also the potential Legion transform of J. Which means that any convex continuous functions may be described as a supremum of affine functions. This is the linear part and this is the kind of pressure. So how does it help in proving the Jensen inequality in a quite general setting? So think about the expectation of F. You can rewrite this thanks to Rockefeller lemma in that way as a supremum of many other random variables. Well, don't bother me with measure regulation here. <laughs> but it can take the sum outside the expectation. It will hurt, but just decrease it. So, if, so this is linear and continuous. You can take it out of the expectation, and you play a vocabulary again, and that's it. That's it. So, given that, we can prove that under some reasonable assumptions, the variance is actually a convex function. Actually, the variance of z may be expressed in this dual form. So it's supremum over all square integral of t among the square integral of functions of two times the expectation of tz minus the variance of t. The supremum is attained by taking t equal z or z minus its expectation. In case it's not set. If equipped with this, you can check that the variance of z functionally on x2, so you first sample x2 and then you look at uh, how how that z vary is larger than the variance of the conditional expectation of z with respect to x1. This is the consequence of this uh, duality. And then we can derive another proof of the of the Einstein inequality. The, cons the consequence of the Einstein inequality is that when you are conditioning, you are increasing the variance. So think that C depends only on one and two variables. That's the essential step is between one and two variables. Then it's just induction. The variance of C may be decomposed that way. So this is the thing we did before, roughly. We use orthogonality of decomposition and network. And then those two animals may be treated in their own way. This one will be soon recognized as the variance of C conditionally on X1. And this one as the variance of the conditional expectation of C, which by the preceding property is smaller than that. And so this is another say look at the proof of the Einstein inequality using the geology argument. And so now that we have checkable proofs, not understandable proofs of the Einstein inequality, we may 
see what the DSM standard inequality has to say about the random package problems. So I will use uh, the version that uh, where, so this version, variance of Z is smaller than the expectation of P. I will define each ZI as a sign of the largest stacking that I can build if I discard the i interval. So, it's a kind of jet map. So what happens then? Well, if the i interval doesn't belong to any witness of the value of z, so it's not a member of a select club, well, select factory, you remove it, it doesn't change anything. So zi equals z. Otherwise, the size of the largest pack packing may just uh, increase by one. If you take a witness, you remove one guy. So zi is at least z minus one. We have this condition. And we also have this condition. And this will be the case for all configuration functions. And for example, we will meet some of them in uh, learning theory, the empirical DC dimension, the empirical platinum dimension, the DC entropy, and things that will show up in, in Olivier's tools, uh, conditional random number averages. All of those function functionals of many independent random variables will exhibit this behavior. And this implies that B, as a random variable, is always smaller than C. C minus CI squared is smaller than B minus CI, and sum of C minus CI is smaller than C. This means that we will have a variance which is smaller than the expectation, some kind of Poissonian behavior. And if you think about this, applying the Chevy Chevy inequality, that it will already tell you that z divided by the expectation of z, uh, expectation of z goes to infinity, this will tend to one one, a kind of, say, uh, stability property that will be enjoyed by those. And actually, we are doing the symptomatic statement. And we can check that on this problem, this quite general function, the Einstein estimate of the variance doesn't shift too much. And we are reading forth from the two variance, the two asymptotical variance, which is, well, not too bad. Given that it's not big mathematics, it doesn't, normally, it doesn't provoke a headache for people. So you can have a non trivial statement, a non trivial intuition about uh, the behavior of Z for a very cheap price. And one of the things we will learn tomorrow is that uh, in many cases, this is true not only at the scale of variance, but at the scale of exponential models. So we will be able not only to play the Markov with the square function, that is Chebyshev inequality, but the exponential mark of the quality for that. We will show that the integrability of C could be intimately related to the integrability of B plus and D. And so that would allow us to carry out some kind of exponential Eckenstein inequality, which would prove to be, well, maybe tedious to do, but easy to do. If you want to use them as a black box, once you know the recipe is straight. So I will stop here. And uh, so if there are people who want to hear about nothing else, we can we can be okay.